Moreton Bay Region Libraries presents Yes, You Can Ask That with Natasha Lester. We sat down with Natasha to ask a few questions. Question 1. Dior Couture, Raven's Book Concentration Camp and Women Pilots in World War II, each of the storylines in the Paris Secret could have been a novel on its own. Can you tell us how you came to put them all together? I do like to combine a few different themes in my books and if you've read any of my previous books like The French Photographer or The Paris Seamstress, you'll see that they're never just about one thing. They're always about a few different things thrown in. And I think what attracts me as a writer is two or three seemingly unconnected ideas suddenly coming together and forming this connection and this um, possible storyline. And so with The Paris Secret, the three or four things that kind of connected in this book were Catherine Dior, the female pilots of the Air Transport Auxiliary, and um, a collection of Christian Dior gowns. Um, I first came across Catherine Dior in a book when I was researching the French photographer, and I had never heard of Catherine Dior. I knew a lot about Christian, but I had no idea his sister worked with the French resistance during the Second World War, was deported by the Nazis to Ravensbrück concentration camp, escaped from the camp at the end of the war, and was awarded a Légion d'honneur and a King's Medal for Courage in the Cause of Freedom by the English because of her work with the resistance, which was so very important. And I wanted to bring Catherine to people's notice because she was an amazingly courageous woman. And so I knew straight away, as soon as I read about her, that she had to be in my next book, The Paris Secret. And at the same time, I came across the story of the Air Transport Auxiliary, a group of amazingly brave female pilots who flew RAF planes during the Second World War around England. They ferried them from maintenance units and factories to the RAF bases. And they flew them in dreadful conditions, appalling conditions. They were um, forced to put up with the most horrendous discrimination. And they just kept flying those planes day in, day out, despite all the obstacles that were put in their way. And again, here was this incredible group of women who very few people knew about, but who more people should know about. So I knew I wanted to write about them as well. Um, and then this is kind of a, a dream storyline of mine, I guess. Um, the book opens with the main character from the contemporary storyline, a woman called Kat, discovering a collection of 65 haute couture Christian Dior gowns in a wardrobe in her grandmother's abandoned cottage in Cornwall. There's one dress for every year dating back to Dior's very first collection in 1947. And um, the book kind of unfolds through these dresses and it's all about the mystery of why Kat's grandmother has those dresses and how she came by them. And that mystery links back to Catherine Dior and the female pilots and many other things. So it was a bit of a challenge to um, intermingle all those different themes, but I like being challenged as a writer. I like trying to do something that maybe is a, a bit too difficult or a bit too ambitious or perhaps shouldn't work and trying to somehow make it work. And I really feel like in The Paris Secret, I was able to pull all of those things together into what I hope is a really readable book. Question two, how much fact and how much fiction is in your books? Why do you like to base your novels so heavily on historical fact? I like to make sure that I have quite a lot of fact in my books, even though they are technically historical novels. And that's important to me for a number of reasons. One of my passions is to find women from history who have been overlooked or forgotten and to bring them back to people's notice. And I like to think that I've done that in the Paris Secret with the women of the Air Transport Auxiliary and with Catherine Dior. And in my previous book, The French Photographer, I like to think that I've done that with the female war correspondents who worked during the Second World War out of Europe. And so it's really important to me not just to make everything up, but to, particularly when you're talking about the experiences of women in the past where they have fought bravely and struggled against discrimination, to make sure that I'm as accurate as possible about those kinds of experiences. Because otherwise, if readers um, are reading about, for instance, the way in which the female pilots of the Air Transport Auxiliary were treated, and how difficult the men of the RAF made it for them to be able to ferry planes around England during the Second World War. And if I make that kind of thing up, then it minimises the battles that those women actually did have to fight to be able to fly those planes. You know, there's enough 
drama inherent in the actual facts of reality um, so that I don't need to make things up. And I think readers appreciate it all the more when they're able to go, wow, those things actually happen. Women were really treated like that. That's outrageous. Um, so because of that, I like to make sure that I have very extensive author's note in the back of my books where people can see what parts of the story are based on fact and also um, to direct people to further reading. And one of the things I love is when readers message me and say, oh, I re went and researched Lee Miller after I read The French Photographer, or I went and did more research on Catherine Dior after I read The Paris Secret. Question three, which writers have inspired you the most and why? I find Margaret Atwood hugely inspirational. Um, she's been an inspiration of mine for years. Back when I first looked at becoming a writer, I enrolled in a Master of Creative Arts at university, and this was back in 2005. And my thesis um, was, I actually wrote my very first book as part of my master's thesis. And I had to write a theoretical component to go with that, which wasn't really my strength. But um, because I loved Margaret Atwood so much, I thought, well, I can probably dissect and analyze a Margaret Atwood book in this thesis and get away with it. So I loved her so much, I kind of incorporated her into my master's thesis. Um, I've also always loved um, the book Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. So that's always been an inspiration for me. In fact, I always joke that my um, fondness for dark haired heroes comes from reading about Rochester when I was like an 11 year old and didn't really know what passion meant, but kind of felt it for the first time when I was reading Jane Eyre. Um, in terms of Australian writers who inspire me, I think we've got lots of wonderful historical novelists. People like Kate Morton are hugely inspirational. She's done uh, amazingly well as a writer worldwide and I really look up to her and um, admire her career and her writing. Question four. Does having a worldwide audience now change the way you approach your book? Having the French photographer hit the New York Times bestseller list last year was very surprising. It was not something I ever expected would happen. And in fact, to the point where um, when my publisher from the US um, emailed me to tell me that the book had made the New York Times bestseller list, she said in that same email, oh, you can cross that off your bucket list now. And I had to confess to her that it was never even on my bucket list because it was unimaginable to me that a writer from Perth in Australia would ever make it onto the New York Times bestseller list. Um, but what that means is, of course, now I know that I have this kind of worldwide audience of literally hundreds of thousands of people um, who are all kind of waiting for the next book, which is lovely. But it also means that I do have to kind of bear in mind the fact that my books aren't just going out to a solely Australian audience anymore. And so when I was writing The Paris Secret, I was writing that a couple of years before my book hit the New York Times bestseller list. So I didn't, when I was writing the book, I had no idea what would happen in terms of my writing career a couple of years down the track when this book might come out. So as I became aware of the fact that I was gathering more of a worldwide audience, um, I did actually change one of the characters in the book, Nicholas Crawford, who was originally English. And um, I made him an American character in the book just to make sure that the Americans feel like you know, there's a character from their country in the book that they can feel connected to. Um, didn't change anything about the story or the plot line of the book. So it was a very easy change to make, but I'm certainly more aware of the fact that I do have readers from all over the world and I want to make them all feel welcomed in my books. Question five. A character from one of your previous novels has a cameo in The Paris Secret. Can you tell us about Darcy Hallway? and how you came to include her in your new novel. In each of my books, I have actually resurrected a character from a previous book who makes a bit of a cameo appearance in the next book. Um, and it, it doesn't matter if a reader hasn't read the previous books, um, it doesn't affect their enjoyment of the book in any way. But for those readers who have read the previous books and recognise the character, they love that and they always send me messages saying, oh, I loved seeing Estella from the Paris seamstress in The French Photographer, for example. And so in The Paris Secret, I have used two characters from The French Photographer, Darcy Hallworth and Josh Vaughan, and they make more than a cameo appearance, in fact, in The Paris Secret. They kind of appear for almost a whole chapter um, in a scene set in a fabulous party in London one night. And I had so much fun um, 
resurrecting those two characters because I loved writing them. They were two of the main characters in The French Photographer. They're really fun people to write about. And I know readers really liked them as well. And when you're creating characters, you become very fond of them because you're building them from scratch and you are imagining them and seeing them and you spend so much time with them every day. And then to kind of close the covers and put them aside and, and never see them again is, is a bit sad, which maybe sounds a little bit weird, but uh, I think most writers will be familiar with that feeling. So when I was writing this scene, set at this party in London, I thought, Darcy and Josh would be the exact kind of people who would go to this party. And so rather than invent and create two other characters, I thought, how fun would it be to have them come to the party and to have readers um, see them a few years down the track from the French photographer and see where their lives have taken them. Question six. Which do you feel is the more important theme in your work, motherhood or women's empowerment? Definitely women's empowerment is probably the most important theme of my books. Um, all of my books largely are about women fighting to do something that is very unusual for a woman to do at that time in history. So for my very first historical novel, A Kiss from Mr Fitzgerald, which is about a woman called Evie trying to become one of the first female obstetricians working in New York City during the 1920s and the struggles she had to face against the male establishment to be able to do that right through to those female war correspondents and the French photographer struggling again against the male establishment to be able to do their jobs, to the female pilots and the Paris secret who have all kinds of obstacles thrown in their way, you know, from people writing in letters to the editor saying that female pilots are disgusting and that women don't have the intelligence to scrub the floor properly, so how dare they become pilots? And women being tasked with flying open cockpit aeroplanes to Scotland in the middle of winter for three hours in minus 30 degrees wind chill and all these horrendous things that women have had to face but they have faced them day in day out those female pilots during the second world war um, faced up to a conditions that we couldn't even imagine today but if it, they hadn't have done that if it hadn't have been for women like that I wouldn't have the opportunities that I have today as a woman so I guess my books are kind of you know, a way of paying homage to those women who did those incredible things and who enabled me to have the opportunities that I do today. Question seven. What are you working on for your next book? Are travel bans affecting your ability to research? My next book has a working title of The Riviera House and that's scheduled for release in 2021. Luckily, I have done all the overseas travel based research for that book. I did that about a year ago, actually. I always do my research quite early um, because I always like to work on my books quite far in advance and make sure I have plenty of time. And that's really um, worked out quite well this time because travel, obviously, internationally or even domestically right at the moment is impossible. Um, I was actually scheduled to go to a book to go to Paris in June to research a book for 2022 and, and obviously that trip has now been cancelled and that research has been put on the back burner for as long as it needs to be put on the back burner for. Um, certainly for me, travelling to the places that my books are set in is incredibly important and I always discover so much when I'm on the ground doing that research and I feel like my books will be much the poorer for not being able to travel but I'm, I'm hopeful that perhaps next year um, travel might have opened up again. Obviously, nobody knows what's going to happen with coronavirus. And the most important thing is that everybody stays safe and well. So luckily, we do have the internet these days. And I can certainly visit many archival collections online. I'm really grateful for the museums and the archives that have digitised documents, which make it so much easier for researchers like myself. And um, I'll just, you know, see what happens in terms of future research plans. But yes, luckily, next year's book, The Riviera House, is all researched, all written. In fact, I'm working on the structural edit for that right now. So we don't have too much more work to go on that book. Question eight. What are you currently reading? Any recommendations? One of the perks of being an author is that we get to read books uh, a little way ahead of when they're actually released to the general public. And at the moment, I'm reading a book by an Australian historical fiction writer called Kate Nunn. The book is called The Silk House, and it's due to be published in a couple of months' time. And it's kind of a, a bit of a gothic mystery um, set around this old house that in contemporary times has been turned into a school. And it's very atmospheric. And 
it has a storyline of, of silk and fabric running through it. And if you've read my books, you'll know how much I love anything to do with fashion. So of course I'm absolutely addicted to that part of the storyline and to the rest of the book as well. So I could definitely recommend in a couple of months time looking out for The Silk House by Kate Nunn. Question nine. As a writing teacher, as well as an author, are writers born or made? I think there are a couple of different parts to being an author. I think that some people are born with a natural ability to join words and sentences together in unique, unexpected and surprising and beautiful ways. And that ability to write incredible sentences, I think is probably something that people are perhaps born with. However, there are many elements of writing that I think you can teach people. You can teach people how to create complex characters. You can teach people about writing about setting. You can teach people how plot should perhaps be shaped. So when you get someone who has that natural ability with words and sentences, and you combine that with someone who has learned about characters and plots and setting, etc., and you put those two things together, you get a writer who's really quite extraordinary. So... I would always recommend to anyone wanting to write a book to go and do some kind of writing course because I think you can learn a lot. I still learn a lot from listening to other writers talk about their own writing processes too. So learning never stops. And writing, you're always learning how to write as you write books. Um, so don't despair if you ever hear people talking about writers being born. Um, there are certainly plenty of elements of writing that you can learn. Um, but I do think, you know, a love of language is probably innate and it comes from perhaps reading widely as a child, which I certainly always did. Thank you for joining us for Yes, You Can Ask That with Natasha Lester, brought to you by Moreton Bay Region Libraries.